Hello, I am Brian Fredericks, and I am presenting to you today to begin your journey of incorporating world music pedagogy into your regular music education curriculum. Personally, I teach middle school orchestra, and this colored much of my own research into world music and ethnomusicology. I hold an aesthetic appreciation for music itself, meaning I believe music is just as essential to society as core subjects such as math, science, and reading. My favorite quote from Dr. Shinichi Suzuki summarizes my view of music in society. Teaching music is not my main purpose. I want to make good citizens. If children hear fine music from the day of their birth and learn to play it, they develop sensitivity, discipline, and endurance. They get a beautiful heart. I see myself following the lead of the educational philosophy of progressivism. I believe the importance of music in society and schools, who should learn and teach music, and what music should be taught is illuminated by the following progressivist principles. Individual motivation should guide the teaching process, the students should learn by doing, and students, parents, and teachers should determine what material is taught. My life has been gratefully influenced by Dr. Shinichi Suzuki, who paved the way for early childhood music instruction halfway through the 20th century. At the age of nine, I began Suzuki violin lessons, and at age 18, I decided to become a string teacher. And at age 30, I took my son to his first Suzuki violin lesson. In a world familiar with intolerance, negativity, and divisive competition, Dr. Suzuki, and of course many other educational pedagogues, wanted to make the world's inhabitants kinder, more loving, and more collectively capable. After the end of World War II, Dr. Suzuki started teaching thousands of children and teachers. His first, and arguably most important, 1961 performance in America showcased over 400 students aged 3 to 17. This standard of talent education inspired the famous cellist Pablo Casals to say, perhaps it is music that will save the world. In an essay in 1944, John Dewey wrote, if we teach today as we taught yesterday, we rob our children of tomorrow. Students, who will be tomorrow's citizens and today's adult citizens, need to prepare for new economic, political, and societal developments. The Platonic and Rousseauian ideals promoted before the 20th century, such as duty, honor, and obedience, may have served a purpose when an infantile industrial economy aided survival. However, Today's schools should teach more progressive ideals. These ideals should include declarative learning, what to do, procedural learning, how to do, and learning about multicultural, intercultural, cross-cultural, and transcultural musics around the globe. Applying world music to the classroom debatably started when Dr. Hood introduced teaching gamelan in his ethnomusicology course in UCLA in the 1960s. Many students in my own middle school classroom are students in the ESOL program. ESOL means English as a Second Language. It's not that strange that many of these students are in my classroom because there are 5.5 million ESOL students in America. The first step to incorporate world music pedagogy into the classroom is to try to transcend any language and cultural barriers that may exist between the teacher, students, and the other students. Clapping is a versatile musical skill and can be used to facilitate cross-cultural communication or the awareness of particular values or beliefs within cultures in order to be able to draw comparisons and communicate appropriately. Instead of using any number of gestures which could be considered rude, teachers can create new gestures with students or use the American Sign Language, ASOL. <laughs> ASL. I personally know some ASL words already because I learned that babies and toddlers who aren't talking yet can developmentally learn and use ASL before verbally speaking. Using nonverbal communication doesn't just help ESL students, but benefits all of these students by avoiding confusion and classroom management problems. A recognition of students' musical cultures can make for an excellent launch into a course or program as the sources for musical diversity are there within the lives of the students. Whether they perform the music themselves or are experienced listeners or are connected to family members who make the music, 
students often are intimately connected to music that is meaningful to them by virtue of their identity, their birthplace, and the surroundings of their community. A multicultural education is challenged with turning theoretical analysis and pronouncements of curriculum reform into full-fledged action as teachers with every intent to be democratic, inclusive, and attuned to the individual needs of all students confront the daily realities of time, energy, and expertise necessary to meet the multicultural goals. Five dimensions of multicultural education are content integration, the knowledge construction process, prejudice reduction, and equity pedagogy, and an empowering school culture and social structure. In Japan, where westernization has been an integral part of the national identity since the late 19th century, school children have within their school music repertoire a set of western orchestral and chamber works to perform and appreciate and songs translated into Japanese from English, French, German, and other languages around the world. Children will continue to be musically enculturated and to be active participants in the music socialization process that wraps itself around them every day, even as the scopes of their environment are impacted and transformed by technology, the media, and the circumstances of their families. I recently created a Connections STEAM overview for my middle school orchestra classes. STEAM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Fine Arts, and Mathematics. According to my document, the class overview is, the orchestra program affiliated with the Fine Arts and STEAM prepares students to appreciate classical and modern orchestral music, as well as popular music, through the hands-on kinesthetic learning of an orchestra instrument including violin, viola, cello, or double bass. My inclusive curriculum goals are as follows. Learn to perform alone and with others an orchestra instrument, including violin, viola, cello, or double bass, using a hands-on kinesthetic method. Learn to read and notate music in order to concentrate on the music being expressed rather than the means of expression. Learn to appreciate classical and modern orchestra music as well as popular music by listening to, analyzing, and describing music, learn to evaluate music of all types as well as music performances, and understand all styles of music in relationship to the arts, other disciplines, history, and culture. After six years of teaching a few classics I learned in grade school orchestra, I began to modernize my concert selections in 2018. What began as just one pop song for a spring concert after extremely positive parent and administrator feedback started defining my orchestra program. My students, parents, and other teachers appreciated hearing the orchestra play music they recognized and could sing along with. Beginning with hiring drummers to play Michael Jackson, Bruno Mars, Coldplay, and the White Stripes repertoire with the orchestra, I soon spearheaded collaboration with my school's band program so the orchestra could have percussion accompaniment at concerts. The positive feedback flowed nonstop. Music is relevant to American culture and my classroom. My class is often each student's favorite class because they get to play music and music matters to them. Content integration refers to the extent to which teachers use examples and content from a variety of cultures and groups to illustrate key concepts, principles, generalizations, and theories in their subject area or discipline. The knowledge construction process describes the ways in which ideas and expectations are formed, noting that implicit cultural assumptions characterize interactions between mostly white and middle class teachers and their students, regardless of race, ethnicity, or other group membership status. Prejudice reduction activities are activities which explicitly address issues of prejudice. Equity pedagogy refers to the process by which educators modify their teaching in ways that will facilitate the academic achievement of students from diverse groups. Creating an empowering school culture means including the entire community of students, teachers, and professional staff to complete multicultural education. The four levels of curriculum reform are contributions, additive, transformation, and social action. In the contribution approach, the experiences of diverse groups are incorporated into learning experiences as a supplement to the typical mainstream-centered curriculum. 
Lessons using the additive approach address issues in more depth than the contributions approach, with content, themes, and concepts incorporated into a variety of activities and understandings. The transformative approach takes an issue and views it from the perspective of different groups, and the social action approach begins with learning experiences from a transformative background, but then requires students to make decisions and take actions related to a concept, issue, or problem that was studied in the unit. As an instrumental music teacher, specifically orchestra, I can assist my students with learning and appreciating world music by, first of all, exposing them to it. They should understand the social and political history of a certain kind of music, then listen to a piece attentively or directed to and focused on musical elements and structures and guided by specific points of attention. Next, my students should use engaged listening or active participation by the listener in some extent of music making, such as singing a melody, patting a rhythm, playing a percussion part, and moving to a dance pattern. Next, students should listen inactively or performing a work in which, through intensive listening to every musical nuance, the music is recreated in as stylistically accurate a way as possible. Advanced classes with lots of practice or performance experience can move on to the next step, which is creating world music. Creating world music involves the student's invention of a new music in the style of a musical model through composition, improvisation, songwriting, and even the act of extending a piece beyond what is represented on recording. The final step to fully implementing the world music pedagogy, according to Campbell, is integrating world music, or examining music as it connects to culture, literature, the sciences, and the visual and performing arts. In essence, the students have connected the music to life in their music education curriculum. In my program, this means my 8th grade orchestra can perform the necessary selections for the upcoming large group performance evaluation, but I also taught them to listen attentively, engagingly, and inactively in order to perform music from a different culture than their own. Diligently sharing recordings of music culled from throughout the globe remains as perhaps the easiest means of providing instrumental music students an initial, broad perspective on world musical cultures. Teachers need to know how to convert their knowledge base about ethnic and cultural diversity into culturally responsive curriculum designs and instructional strategies. Culturally responsive teaching, or CRT, is not aligned with political correctness. Culturally responsive teachers respect, value, and know about diverse cultures and experiences. They also understand the roles of power, privilege, and oppression in our society and are willing to directly address inequity and injustice to develop socio-political consciousness in their students. We should not set out to study world music badly, but there is much understanding to be gained from the endeavor, regardless of the level of skill attained. An example of incorporating world music pedagogy in the classroom is teaching a lesson to one of my middle school orchestra classes about the Chinese New Year, a major worldwide event that may not be familiar to a lot of Americans. The lesson would teach the history and impact of the annual Chinese New Year. After learning about the history and relevance of the Chinese New Year, students will listen attentively to the melody Gong Chi Gong Chi, or English Greetings Greetings. The students would then practice engaged listening while reading the lyrics and singing along. As children are enticed by instruments to touch, to hold, and to play, it's a reasonable decision for teachers to want to have a sufficient supply of djembes, ukuleles, tin whistles, gongs, steel pans, and xylophones, or when studying Chinese instruments, <laughs> erus, goos, and bolong goos. And no, I don't, do not speak any of those languages. The students would perform and listen to Gongxi Gongxi and actively while the instructor assesses them with a variety of strategies, including instantaneous feedback, evaluation of posture, intonation, and behavior, and a written rubric. It would cover my first skill goal, learn to perform alone with others an orchestra instrument, including violin, viola, cello, or double bass using a hands-on kinesthetic method. My fourth skill goal, learn to evaluate music of all types, as well as music performances. And my fifth knowledge goal, understand all styles of music in relation to the arts, other disciplines, history, and culture. The lesson would begin with the history and popularity of the Chinese New Year standards 10 and 11, 
Attentive Listening, Standards 4, 5, and 9, Engaged Listening, Standards 6, 7, and 8, and Inactive Listening and Performing, Standards 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, Attentive Listening, Standards 4, 5, and 9, Engaged Listening, Standards 6, 7, and 8, and Inactive Listening and Performing, Standards 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. Finally, the lesson would culminate in a variety of assessment strategies, including using instantaneous feedback or immediately feedback throughout the class. As an instrumental music teacher, every second of class is spent in evaluation. The students should receive an evaluation every time they start playing, posture, every time they play, orally, and even when they stop playing, behavior. I would also monitor and report on their independent practice. For documentation purposes, I could even utilize a written rubric. A written evaluation of an Anchor Standards 10 and 11 could include a multiple choice quiz taken on the Socrative app on students' laptops, cell phones, or even together as a class. The provision of access and opportunity in music and in all the arts to all students has become a centerpiece of strategic planning within professional organizations like NAFME and in schools and universities as well. And initiatives are more evident now than ever a generation ago for making bands, choirs, orchestras, and music teacher education programs look like America in all its diversity. When millions of immigrants began arriving in America at the end of the 19th century, so too did their songs, dances, and instruments, which were performed regularly outside schools for ceremonies and celebrations at churches and community gatherings. Invitations by the State Department brought many artists and educators from Latin America to the United States, even as American music educators traveled to, South, to Mexico, Brazil, and Argentina. From an American presence on various fronts in war years, previously little-known peoples and places in the West, the Pacific, and well into Africa became known, and curricular inventions were reflecting those worlds. Western orchestra music is different today than it was in the 18th century. American popular music has undergone rapid change from the 1920s to today. Hip-hop has gone through considerable evolution from the time of Grandmaster Flash in the late 1970s to musicians like Kendrick Lamar today. Music is not static. New instruments, recording devices, and other possibilities for listening to music in new ways. For students, musical understanding of a genre within a culture is ever more complete when its historical evolution is acknowledged and studied. This concept of an evolving genre and living traditions must be recognized, and music teachers need to use their limited time wisely teaching genres and styles across time. Music and musicians have a mini-culture in their larger society, but music is an object of art within a larger culture. Teachers should try not to reinvent the wheel when they develop curriculum. Collaborating is a necessary part of any professional endeavor, whether it is citing a scholarly work as a reference, emailing a colleague to see their syllabus, concert schedule, or con content standards, or asking professionals for help teaching world music pedagogy. Millions of people are musical culture bearers, or musicians who have one foot in Western music culture and another foot in any one of the thousands of musical cultures around the world. I consulted a good friend of mine who is a culture bearer from Hong Kong. In January 2011, I performed at the Central Conservatory in Beijing, China, as well as in Xi'an, China, with the Kennesaw State University Symphony Orchestra. As a Suzuki-trained violinist from the age of eight, I internalized diverse world musics and Eastern educational and pedagogical wisdom. But physically traveling, performing, and observing performances in China cemented a deep appreciation of Chinese culture, as well as empathy for all world musics, creeds, cultures, and educational practices of people around the globe. In the summer of 2021, I reached out to my good friend Julie Kuhn, a renowned performing musician who has graced the stage around the world. Julie even made time to perform with my humble group, the Atlanta Sound Quartet, based in Atlanta, Georgia. Julie Kung is a sought-after cellist and violist who has performed with orchestras since the age of six. My first question was, what made you want to become a musician? Probably the love of being around music from an early age and just getting so much joy out of it. The experience of playing music, of either playing cello, piano, or singing, or any of that. And then later on, I took violin lessons 
because in school orchestra, I got kind of bored, <laughs> and so I wanted to do, do something different and learn a new instrument. All one, all the while playing all the other instruments at the same time. So I ended up doing violin, viola, cello, and you know, originally from Hong Kong. And then they all moved to Canada after my parents moved to Canada. My grandmother is originally from Hong Kong. And then they all moved to Canada after my parents moved to Canada because my parents told my other relatives what a great place Canada was to live. And so we had a whole bunch of relatives move from Hong Kong to Canada. Dad got a job in Canada, and then later on he got a job in the U.S., and that company moved him from Canada to U.S., and that's how we came over here. Do you mean over here, like, like Georgia? Yeah. Uh, his company moved him from Toronto to Chicago, and then after some years, he got another job in Georgia, and that company moved him from Chicago to Georgia. I grew up listening to mainly people singing in the Cantonese language and also some traditional Chinese music, but also, you know, non-traditional music. So I just grew up with regular uh, Western music too. And that was in Canada, Chicago, and Georgia. So when I was in college at Georgia Tech, I actually studied abroad and went to Hong Kong for one semester, which was about four months. <laughs> Looked at when I was growing up, I was in an orchestra called the MISO in Chicago, Metropolis Youth Symphony Orchestra, and we traveled to Australia for the Olympic Games in 2001. We played for their, you know, Olympic torch relay ceremonies that they had at different cities. We would play that music, right, that you, you play whenever the torch comes around to that city. Also was the same one who traveled to places like Budapest, Hungary, and uh, Romania, Czech, Czech Republic. So I think traditional Chinese music has a lot of wandering notes. So you don't usually stay on a note and it's not as you're used to hearing like, the tones and the melodies. Even the melody of some of these traditional songs, if you try to sing it after just listening to it one time, you'll probably get it wrong because of how much the note goes. It, you, it, you just very, I don't know how to explain it, but you probably will come. Okay. Um, and now, uh, thank you <laughs> for, for watching my introduction. Uh, I wanted to share with you some more world music resources I discovered, such as Smithsonian and Folkways. I found an amazing lesson plan titled Discovering the East of China, Chinese Music in Elementary School. This plan served as a template for the lesson plans in my music culture curricular unit. I had a heck of a template. <laughs> And, oh no, I'm sorry. What? Another wonderful music resource is the Association for Cultural Equity. This website has a section called Director's News, which keeps readers up to date with new music on the website, as well as this podcast, then all around the world. Right here. <laughs> that sounds really cool. I would love, love to travel the real world. Um, right now, I'm trying to plan out family trips to where my ancestors lived over in Europe. I didn't focus on China right away when I researched world music. Uh, as a Suzuki violin student my whole life, I researched Japanese folk songs and discovered a couple recordings of Sakura on the British Library World and Traditional Music website. So... Search Sakura. And you can have this on this website. Okay. Um, 
and a resource that gave me much success finding information about my transcription song, which was Chinese, was the Oxford Global Music Series. Uh, this Chinese folk song book specifically mentions my transcription song, Jasmine Flower, in its program notes, which we'll talk about later. A resource that more band, orchestra, and chorus students will be more familiar with is J So here's Fantasy on a Japanese Folk Song. This is actually an LGPE selection. I think it's uh, um, level two. The haunting Sakura melody moves through stunning and beautiful transformations in this musical fantasy before finally coming to rest. Tonal centers switch between minor and major as traditional melodies intertwine with thoughtful counter melodies and contemporary harmonies. And this is another song that's on the LGPE list which is a level three. And my internet has always worked until right this moment. Well, anyway, it's called Korean, here we go. Korean folk tune, Richard Meyer, um, very famous uh, arranger for orchestra. Very pretty, familiar Korean folk song is presented in this wonderful arrangement. And then, oh dear. Here's Chinese songs are also on J.W. Pepper. This is Jasmine Flower, um, happens to be the arrangement that I did, but um, I didn't look at that one. Okay, now I hope you will assist me with going over a simple world music lesson. <laughs> uh, I get, got my violin ready, so I hope you can take out your instrument in order to participate with me today. Uh, thanks. The folk song I chose to transcribe was, again, I don't speak Chinese, but it's Mo Li Hua. Mo Li Hua is Chinese for jasmine flower. One version for SATB voice was archived in the Oxford University Press. The vocal score was written by Bob Chilcott. And the Oxford Global Music Series, an album by Zhu, Zhu Wang, has been archived. The program notes for Zhu Wang's album say that the piece Jasmine Flower is popular in China and abroad. The lyrics are, Jasmine Flower, such a beautiful flower, her sweet scent overwhelms all others in the garden. I want to pluck her for myself, but I'm afraid of the garden's keeper. Jasmine Flower, such a beautiful flower. Should be playing in the background while I'm singing this. <laughs> she is white as snow when she is blooming. I want to pluck her for myself, but I'm afraid of gossip surrounding. Jasmine Flower, such a beautiful flower. Her looks surpass all others in the garden. I want to pluck her for myself, but I'm afraid she won't bloom in the year to come. The version of Jasmine Flower I transcribed was sung by Cal Kin and had 702,000 views on YouTube on July 6, 2021. And here's what hers sounds like. This is the version I used to transcribe. So you carefully so you can see tell how I did.
And then my version is here. summary of my Chinese folk song lesson is that uh, it will teach the history and popularity of the Chinese folk song Mo Li Hua. After learning about the relevance of the song, the students will listen attentively to the melody and lyrics of the song uh, to understand why it is so popular around the world. The students will then practice engaged listening while reading the lyrics and singing along. The students will perform and listen to Mo Li, Li Hua inactively while the instructor passes them assesses them with a variety of strategies, including instantaneous feedback, evaluation of posture, intonation, and behavior, and a written rubric. Suggested grade level is uh, sixth through eighth grade because I teach middle school orchestra. The country is China. Uh, genre is folk song, and the instruments um, in my arrangement are violin, cello, and voice. Um, and I know the voice wasn't working in my version of finale for some reason. Um, but obviously any instrument that can read a vocal line like flute or clarinet or anything, right, uh, or tre uh, treble clef or bass clef, it'll work fine for this arrangement. So that covers every band and orchestra instrument, um, except for maybe a couple. Uh, anyway, there are co-curricular areas for this assignment, um, social studies, ELA, and even physical education. Um, the national standards, there are national core fine art standards for this particular lesson on Chinese music and culture. I won't read them all to you, but this lesson covers the standards 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11. Uh, prerequisites are basic rote singing and reading ability. The objectives are um, to learn to perform alone and with others an orchestra instrument, kinesthetic, learn to read and notate music in order to concentrate on the music being expressed, skill, learn to appreciate classical and modern orchestra music as well as popular music and world music by listening to, analyzing, and describing it. So that's a disposition attitude standard. Um, and then the material I used was Smithsonian folkways, um, Chinese classical instrumental music, and then supplemental resources were the lyrics. So I found a simplified Chinese version of the lyrics and then there's a poetic English translation and then the English version sing along are, is what we will sing a little later. I also did uh, text excerpts. So these text excerpts are snippets from the scholarly sources I discovered about Jasmine Flower. And the history and popularity of Mo Li Hua. Um, Mo Li Hua or Jasmine Flower in English is a popular Chinese folk song from the Hianyan region. <laughs> Again, I don't speak Chinese. That was the best I could do. It has been used during events such as the 2004 Summer Olympics. And the 2008 Summer Olympics. And the, uh, even the 2011 Chinese protests. Wait, before you scroll away, you need to hear this. So um, 
A little bit of trivia for you. The uh, Chinese protests that were happening during the 2008 Olympics uh, all the way through 2011 was called the Jasmine Revolt by a lot of people. So this um, obviously um, has to do with current events and, um, and is applicable to culture. I'm going to show you this beautiful performance of Jasmine Flower while I talk. <laughs> Mo Li Hu was written during the Qing Long era, 1735 through 1796 of the Qing dynasty. Um, there are several re regional versions of the song with different lyrics and melody. One version of the song describes the custom of giving jasmine flowers, popular in the southern Yangtze Delta region of China. The song is one of the most popular in all of China. In 1896, it was even used as the national anthem for the Qing Chinese officials in Europe. Um, they don't use it for that anymore, but that's interesting. Uh, during the 2011 Chinese pro-democracy protests, the song became associated with the Jasmine Revolution as organizers instructed protests to play Mo Li Hua on their cell phones as a form of anti-government protest. The song was placed on authorities' list of online censored materials. Videos of the song, including at least one from an official event, were removed from Chinese websites. Um, and in 2013, even Celine Dion performed the song in Mandarin on Chinese state TV as part of its New Year gala show, welcoming in the Lunar New Year. Um, I believe this year, the, in 2021, the, the New Year, Chinese New Year was in April, and I already showed footage of that um, earlier in this presentation. Uh, my orchestra has performed this J.W. Pepper version of Jasmine Flower which is the one that I played for you a little bit earlier. So um, after, after doing that, the next step in the lesson is attentive listening. Um, and we already watched this video of Kyle Kin performing Mo Li Hua. Um, but I would ask the students to recognize elements of the song that make it so important to people that live in China. And then next is engaged listening. We would watch and listen to the video of Mo Li Hua provided by Etsy Mandarin. So that's, China, I believe that's Chinese for uh, easy Mandarin. Okay, so I think you understand what's going on there. And then finally, um, here's the, oh, sorry. The, uh, finally is an active listening and performing. So I would ask the students to mute their Zoom microphone and read the sheet music, my sheet music with their instrument, voice, treble clef instrument or bass clef instrument. So we could all play along if you wanna do that with me, uh, Nicole. <laughs> Thank you.
All right, and uh, finally, here's the assessment plan for the lesson. In order to assess the class, I always use instantaneous feedback or immediate feedback throughout the class. As an instrumental music teacher, every second of class is spent in evaluation. The students should receive evaluation every time they start playing, every time they play, and even when they stop playing. I also monitor and report on their independent practice. For documentation purposes, I could provide this rubric. So the first 10 points on posture, 10 points on left hand technique, 10 points on right hand technique, and 10 points on rhythm and tempo, and even 10 points for concert etiquette. So that's supporting their other classmates. In Google Classroom, in order to get your best performance possible, I would ask you to go to a website, record yourself playing, and then send it to me via Google Drive in Google Classroom so I can evaluate you properly. It's how I evaluated my orchestra students during 2020 virtual learning. Uh, now, I'd like to click on, on this and demonstrate to you how to use it. So it's a website called Bukuru. And I actually already presented this in, in, a, in a real professional development um, meeting with uh, District 6 in Georgia. Um, I was the only teacher that knew, I was the only instrumental music teacher that knew about this website. So it's, a, it's a simple website, it's not blocked or anything, uh, and at least not in my county. And the students go to it and they press the button and they can record themselves. Uh, I just wish I'm going to, I'm going to need a microphone to show you. Sorry. I guess nobody's immune to the Zoom technical difficulties. Okay. So let me go ahead and try this. So just like that, the, the students can record themselves on the website and listen to what they sound like. And then you see at the bottom here, it says save and share. And it's really that simple. They literally just copy the link and then they can send it to me and they can email the link right to me or they can send it to me in Google Drive. They can just send me the link. They, they don't have to download the file or anything difficult like that. They literally just copy and paste the link into Google Drive or Google Classroom or Canvas or whatever your county is using. And then I can listen to them online. I can listen to them on my phone if I'm checking my emails on my phone. And it's that simple to evaluate and use a rubric if I, if I want to, okay? Very cool website, but that, that would be something I can use during virtual learning to evaluate students. All right, well, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for watching it and participating. <laughs> um, do you have any questions for me? Everything was great, Brian. I really like that last oh. resource that you shared. Um, I haven't heard of that before. I've been using Flipgrid. And I think there are just one too many clicks for Flipgrid, but I like this website you shared because you log in, well, you go to the website, you click record, that's it. I love that. <laughs> oh, thank you. I mean, I obviously uh, Flipgrid is more mainstream and uh, that's what a lot of teachers use. So that's that's obviously perfectly fine, but you're right. I um, For my students, um, I just, I thought that I would try this out first. Mm -hmm. I went to Flipgrid um, because not my, no, no one in my school uses it um, other than a couple teachers. Yeah. Um, and I thought this Vukuru would just be a lot simpler just to throw at them in Google Classroom. And it did work. If it hadn't worked, the next step would have been, like you said, Flipgrid. That's a wonderful um, app as well. Yeah. I loved all your information <clears throat> about the, I mean, the traditional Chinese tune that you talked about. I love the fact that you were able to go to China and actually experience playing with other musicians. I mean, that had to be, had to be amazing. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, it, we did. Yeah, back, it was, um, it was winter 2011. You probably saw in all the pictures I had a coat on mm -hmm. um, <laughs> because it was freezing cold. Um, it, it, it's not any warmer in China. 
<laughs> um, but yeah, that was really cool to get uh, pictures at the Great Wall of China. That was obviously my favorite spot. Um, and uh, like we did perform there as well. Um, there's a picture that um, didn't show up for some reason in the in the PowerPoint, but it um, it's the picture of our performance poster. And uh, it's it had it says Kennesaw State University Orchestra performance in English, and then underneath that it's in Mandarin. Um, because most of our audience were were people who were Chinese. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go ahead and end my recording.